Aloha and welcome to the Ruderman Roundtable. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman from the District of Pune and Ka'u on the Big Island. And I'm your host here on Think Tech's program, Ruderman Roundtable, where we focus on environmental and good government issues. Today I'm joined by Marty Townsend, director of the Sierra Club for Hawaii. Thank you for joining me, Marty. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate very, it. Very nice to see you outside the halls of the legislature. <laughs> uh, so the Sierra Club encompasses a wide range of policy issues facing Hawaii. Yes. What are the biggest challenges facing Sierra Club and, and its efforts in Hawaii? So I think, you know, at the core of everything that we do um, is battling climate change. So, mm. uh, you know, that encompasses a wide range of things, like you said, from uh, in spa invasive species controls, shoreline erosion. Um, but the thing that's really sort of percolated to the top is our water issues. And so everything from uh, ensuring water uh, quality, um, but also water quantity, so restoration of streams, um, ensuring you know the natural connections between the ocean and, and freshwater streams, um, as well as you know in making sure that our water resources aren't contaminated, um, and that's a significant undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, dovetailing with that um, is clean energy. Um, we know that th we have to address the root causes of climate change mm -hmm. and that is our fossil fuel based economy. And so Hawaii is uh, you know, taking the leadership role in converting, making a just transition to a, a fossil free fuel, a fossil fuel free future. Um, but, uh, and, and that's a huge undertaking. I mean, we have the commitment to 100% renewable by 2045, uh, but there's still a lot to get, to, uh, you know, to get us actually there, you know, the next set of benchmarks. Um, and yeah, so it's it's a huge undertaking, and uh, it's uh, for the most part, uh, you know, I'm the paid staff for the Sierra Club, but uh, we're really a volunteer-led organization, and uh, it's a huge group of volunteers who work to help make all that happen. Now, when you say you're the paid staff, does that mean you're the entire paid staff? <laughs> well. For a long time, the Sierra Club yeah. had only one staff person, oh, so and uh, we were just blessed with a major donation, and so we will oh. be scaling up. Uh, so we have uh, a few new staff people coming on. And, and how many volunteers, or how many people are actively are involved with the Sierra um, Club? That's a hard question to answer because there's yeah. so many different facets different. of it. So, um, in terms of like our political work, the things that we do at the Capitol to make change happen there are about. 60 people who are regularly like engaged in specific issues um, and then separate from that is a whole nother community of people who are working on um, outdoor education programs um, they host um, hikes and mm -hmm, yeah. you know cleanups and trail restorations and work days at, at farms um, uh, almost every weekend on uh, on all the major islands so nice yeah well speaking legislatively first what are the most pressing concerns for the CR Club, and what's the first thing you would do to move the legislature to solve it? Well, so you know, we've been working on clean energy, we've been working on water issues, uh, working on invasive species controls, funding for a Department of Land Natural Resources. Uh, but all of these battles, the thing that they kind of that they have in common is um, the makeup of our capital. If we um, had a uh, a legislative body that um, recognized the importance of you know, long-term investments in environmental protection, um, Sierra Club's job would be much easier. So really a lot of the things that we um, work on would uh, greatly benefit from improvements to our electoral process. Um, how we get people elected um, uh, has a significant impact on what policies we're allowed to get passed. So. What do you mean? Tell me more about that. <laughs> how does how does how we get people elected relate to the environment? Well, so the reality that we are all confronted with is that um, private corporations have um, an outsized influence in our democracy. Uh, you know, there's a study in 2014 um, from Princeton University and Northwestern University where they found that 90% um, of average Americans. Um, have zero influence on uh, elected politics, on, on the decisions that their uh, representatives make, and that really the entities that have the most influence are those who donate. Um, I think that that study found something like two-thirds um, of the um, political and donations uh, came from 0.2% of the American population. Like that just blows my mind. Um, and it's all about this, you know, uh, 
reciprocal economic relationship, right? So the politicians, they have to raise an absurd amount of money in order to win an election. So the companies will give them that money. And then in turn, the companies come around have to meet those victors and ask for uh, tax subsidies, for example. Um, I think that same study found that over the past five years, um, the 200 most politically active companies, meaning they um, contributed to campaigns and they contributed to political causes, um, they spent about uh, almost $6 billion total over five years. But in return, they got more than $4 trillion in tax subsidies in the US. So that gives an idea of like, the economy that we're working in in terms of our own politics. And so I feel like campaign finance, which is a huge honor, but it's an important issue. We need to have you know, uh, a fair playing field so that people who have equal rights um, have an equal voice. Um, so it's things, you know, it's all kinds of electoral pol political changes, things that you've worked on yourselves that mm -hmm. we need to get changed, but we're not going to get changed until we get, uh, you know, because it's not in the interest of incumbents, right? So that's part of the reason why voter turnout is so important, um, but at the same time, why voter turnout is so low. Because and we just had a world record low voter turnout. World record turnout. low, like, oh my God, it was like, it was 30%, just over 30%, that's crazy. And that's in a state that is the lowest in the nation of voter <sighs> turnout. So it was, it's an it's a, it's a all-time low, I think we saw. Yeah. And I think you pointed to at least one of the reasons why is because a lot of people feel they have no influence on their government yeah. because of the outsized influence of corporate Right. Money, huh? Yeah, and it's been it's been part of a downward turn since the '50s, a mm -hmm. consistent downward turn. And I mean, there are a lot of like ancillary issues that can point to why it was a low voter turnout. Um, for one thing, we had many more people registered to vote um, this past primary election than the previous primary election. Um, something like forty thousand people registered. Um, but that, together with having a less number of people actually voting, made mm -hmm. that drop even more significant. Even more dramatic. But um, and you know, there's people highlighted that uh, you know. We didn't have like a major like statewide ticket happening, like no governor's race, no contentious um, of congressional race, um, and so That's people true. weren't that very interested. But um, I think those are you know sort of all ancillary. It really comes down to do people feel like it makes a difference that they vote? And I, there were a lot of people who got engaged while Senator Sanders was running for president, and the fact that he was that was no longer part of the conversation. I think people just sort of tuned back out, and and that's really unfortunate. I think mm -hmm. that's something that we. Um, who are concerned about improving politics in Hawaii need to figure out how to address. We need to keep people engaged. Um, we need to make it easier to vote. I feel like people should just be automatically registered to vote. You know, Oregon passed the law. People are automatically registered to vote once they go to get a driver's license. I mean, you, there's several ways you could do it. People who pay taxes, once you pay taxes, you're registered to vote. You make it so super easy. You don't have no registration, nothing. And then you just focus on, you know, uh, people who are doing like identity theft kinds of things to prevent voter fraud. But there's none of this like you have this form or that form or you turned it in by this time or that time. Um, you make it a right, an inherent right, and you make it a holiday. Every election day should be a holiday. Yeah. And it should be a big deal that yeah. we that you go and vote. Go vote yeah. yeah. So and I and I think we do those kinds of things and we can start to then pass laws that actually address some of the fundamental problems in our voting system. Um, you know, this idea that we must choose the lesser of two evils. Why not have a voting system where votes are ranked, right? You have instant runoffs. And so if my top choice doesn't win, um, that's OK, because my votes then get counted towards my second choice. And the second choice has as much, has a better opportunity of winning. And so. are there places in the country that have, well, what's that called, ranked choice? I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah, well, it's either called rank voting or um, instant runoff. Instant runoff. Uh, Is there places that do that? Yeah, places do, do do that. And, and it seems to be working. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's no, like, major riots the or anything like that. because the sky they, has not fallen. <laughs> the sky has, has not, not fallen, fallen. right. Okay. Um, um, and like we could also do stuff like party ballots, you know, like, as it is right now, you have to decide which party you're voting for and then you can only vote for candidates that are in that party. Why not separate those two? Vote for the party and those parties get seats assigned based on the percentage of votes that they collect, right? So if you get 5% of the vote, then you have 5% of the seats in the mm -hmm. House and the Senate. And then people can vote for whichever candidates they want, not necessarily oh, being, uh, being tied to one party or another. 
that might be well, awesome. might be a big change. Huh? <laughs> but we really can't do any of those until we have people turning out to vote. And uh -huh. uh, because you know, incumbents are not going to make these kind of changes to the voting system, it doesn't serve their interests. So, so uh, when I think about good government and what, what would make our democracy more responsive, there's sort of two big issues, one of which you touched on, which is uh, campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm which might include even publicly funded elections. Right. And then there's all the other good government things like better, uh, easier voter access, perhaps term limits, voter initiative, um, you know, right. lobbying reform. So uh, the big one, which we mentioned of um, campaign finance, I, I have one friend that says that's the reform that makes all other reforms possible. Right, right. But of course, as you just mentioned, we're not going to get there because most incumbents see it as contrary to their best interest and won't let it pass. Mm -hmm. How can we ever make any progress on this issue? It's kind of a catch-22. It right? is a catch-22. And so the thing is, I think people need to come overcome this defeatist sense of, like, my vote doesn't count, uh -huh. uh, and get out there and vote for the candidates that are going to support this. So we, you know, we had a significant, a notable number of progressives running for the first time um, against incumbents, mm -hmm. and um, the low voter turnout really hurt them. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them yeah. really had a, a really great shot, and if the voter turnout had been better, they may be in office right now, and those are people who would have voted for campaign finance reform. I see. So um, it's, it's part of our own human psychology where we have to overcome that inherent sense of, like, uh, my vote doesn't count, doesn't make a difference, they're going to do whatever it is they want anyway, whatever in their interest. We have to play the long game and recognize that uh, the more we engage in the process and the more we, uh, yeah, put our weight behind those that are going to fight for us. And even if they don't win this time, they will fight again the next time. Like, keep it going, right? That's the only way that we're going to be able to build the momentum we need to to make these kind of fundamental changes. Okay. And so we, so we just had this incredibly low voter turnout right after this huge wave of new people getting involved mm -hmm. with the Senator Sanders campaign. Where, where do you see us right now? Are those people that just got involved, are they going to stay involved, or do we have to somehow re, uh, reinvigorate them or re-inspire uh, them, or what's, go what's going to happen next? It's, it's, I mean, oh, if only I knew it was going to happen <laughs> next, I would be... <laughs> I was counting on you to know. <laughs> Um, I, you know, it's, we're going to have to keep them engaged. We're going to have uh -huh. to find those issues that people are going to feel like, yeah, this makes a difference. It matters that I'm engaged. Um, because we're going to need them in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no guarantee that we're going to have the Senator Sanders to help invigorate people. you got to be self-motivated. I mean, Senator Sanders turned you on, right? Uh, he inspired you. Um, you feel like um, for once in your life there was a politician that was, you know, speaking to you and uh, and you need to harness that inspiration and have it, you know, motivate you for the next five years. Like, we need to, this is going to be, you know, a multi-year struggle to regain our democracy. And, and if we fail to do it, uh, voter turnout is just going to get worse. And, you know, the special interest services that the capital currently provides are only going to get worse. And so we don't really have a choice but to engage. We have to, or we're giving up. And for me, that's just not an option. Do you think it's going to be possible to do that? To yes, I do. I do. I think actually, you know, for the the, the eight people that ran on the you know on the progressive ticket who went through, um, uh, they, I think, really inspired um, young people to get more involved. And I, yeah. I think over the next two years, we're going to see even more engagement. Um, it's going to be um, tough. We're going to have to find those issues that really speak to uh, a wide range of voters. And like you said, um, campaign finance reform is the reform that makes all of the reforms possible. And, uh, and so if we can you know, stay focused on that issue or one like it that speaks to all of us, um, then I think we have a, we have a real shot. Um, the main thing is for us to not get disheartened. Well, you've inspired me just to hear you, uh, <laughs> hearing your optimism. <laughs> and I'm here with Marty Townsend, Marty Townsend, director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii, and as we're on the Ruderman Roundtable, we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. 
So come around, we'll see you then. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Welcome back. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. You're here at the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Hawaii. We're with Marty Townsend, director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii. Thank you once again, Marty, for being with us. Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. We were just talking about uh, government and good government and things that might make it better. Uh, let me ask you one more question before we leave that subject. If you could achieve one change or improvement that would make our government better, our democracy better, what would it be? Tough question. tough question. Uh, it could be two things if there's not one. Well, focusing locally, which is where I work the most, um, you know, I hope that the uh, incumbents who, got, who are back in office will take note of um, the amount of enthusiasm and interest that came from these new challengers and will, you know, look upon themselves to try to improve the process a little bit. Um, in my experience, I've found that the the rules, the internal rules to the House and the Senate um, are, are tough. They are slated towards or slanted towards benefiting um, the, the leadership. Um, they don't necessarily serve uh, public interest, transparency, ensuring political, uh, public engagement. Um, so I would like to see those rules um, loosened a little bit um, so that they can't be so easily manipulated at, um, and uh, you know, used to sort of circumvent what clearly might be the, the you know, general popular concern. Um, I feel like there's just way too much um, emphasis on the leadership, right? You have to be in leadership in order to make any change happen. And that, in my opinion, undermines the functionality of our democracy. Um, and it, it turns what should be, you know, uh, it, it gives political weight to things that aren't, have nothing to do with improving public policy. And, um, and that's unfortunate. I think that's part of the reason why we have such apathy is because we've allowed that style of politics, transactional politics to happen, um, uh, to, to, to dominate as opposed to like legitimate, genuine problem solving for the public interest. So, yeah, I have hope that the House and the Senate leadership will amend some of their internal rules. But well, let me just play devil's advocate for a minute. Yes, we please. talk about the progressive candidates that didn't quite make it. Uh -huh. What would make an incumbent who maybe faced one of those, what would make them say, oh, I better pay attention instead of thinking, well, you see, they can't unseat me after all, so I'll just be business as usual is just fine. What would make them... You think anything happened to make them? Yeah, I think uh, for uh, for several of them, it was really close, okay. and they were s the skin of their teeth was a low uh -huh. voter turnout. And if oh, we continue right. to engage voters and get people to turn out more, um, then they may not be so lucky next election. And so their choice is to uh, evolve here and listen to the the voice of the public, um, or to risk you know getting voted out in the next election. I mean, I think it's a mistake for us to look at like just one election mm -hmm. and that makes all the difference in the world. It's yeah. never like that. The, all of the stuff true. is, is long-term, cyclical, and, um, and you know, for many of us, we're in it for the long haul. Um, a lot of the challengers, uh, the progressive challengers, indicated that they would run again. Um, and so, yeah, so I think there's, there, it's in the self-interest of the incumbents to, to embrace some change. Good. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> So let's switch a little bit to talk about agriculture in Hawaii. It's another area of focus that affects the environment, and of course, Sierra Club is involved. What are some of Hawaii's greatest needs, agriculturally speaking? Uh, so I'm not a farmer myself, but in working with farmers, um, I found that um, it's just it is a really tough row. Um, access to water, access to land access to financing. I mean, a lot of small farmers have a hard time getting the money they need to get started. Um, I feel like those three things 
the way the way it currently is is set up to benefit large corporations, industrial agriculture, and not set up to benefit small farmers. Um, I think there's a lot that we could do in public policy to help um, improve access to financing for farmers and ensure fair access to water. I mean, I'm very concerned about the evolution as we evolve away from sugar. Right, we've been evolving since the 1980s, and but we haven't been uh, making the long-term decisions that we need to to ensure that everyone has fair access to water uh, for for things like diversified agriculture. We've kept a lot of the control of water with a few private corporations, um, you know, the sugar plantations, and um, and it's, that's not necessarily in the benefit of all of us. It's in the benefit of a few. Um, but water in Hawaii is a public trust resource. Um, no one owns the water, um, and we, as the public, uh, should just ensure that there is fair and easy access to the water um, so that everyone can benefit. Um, so that, that's been a, a fundamental issue for the Sierra Club. We want to see the restoration of streams, and we want to see the diversification of agriculture um, to really, uh, you know, restore Hawaii to a more sustainable economy. Uh, now you mentioned access to land as well as water, and I hear from some small farmers that that's such an important issue because, first of all, not only is it hard for them to get access to the land, but if they don't have any long-term equity in the land, mm -hmm. then their financing becomes more of a challenge, which is the third issue right. you mentioned. So those two are very, very related. It's one thing to own land and be able to borrow money against it, but if you're just leasing the land and if it's yeah. just a year-to-year -year lease, exactly. you're not going to get finance for the right. equipment and the improvements you might that's, that's one issue that the Sierra Club has been working on uh, with the Department of Land Natural Resources is their, um, their land division has been focusing on these short-term you know, annual permits, um, and which has really made it difficult for small farmers to make, get the financial investment that they need. Mm -hmm. And so trying to push DLNR to embrace these long-term um, lease relationships with farmers who've demonstrated a commitment to the land. They've been there since the 70s, whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't have a long-term lease. What are some of the other things that the Sierra Club is working on to support agriculture? Um, so we also do a lot of hands-on stuff. So we have uh, we started this year with a, what we call lahanas or work days, and so we're. Um We've been doing it once a quarter, and now we're going to start doing it once a month. So basically, 20 or so volunteers go to a, a local farm and help with whatever labor they need. So really? we've been working at a taro farm and helping them to uh, break open more patches and clear the the mud and make you know prepare the land for the planting of the of the huli, and then you know helping them to you know restore their alwai, the ancient uh, you know the diversions from the stream, and get it to go back to the stream. It's really um, rewarding work, and it's something that has a direct benefit benefit on these farmers who then can mm -hmm. take their their taro or whatever their product is to market. So, how do you, this, so this is individual farms or yep. farmers that need help and yep. you, fi you find a way to prioritize them and say we're going to go help this one this yes, month. Yes, right. It's kind of like, I don't know um, if you're familiar with Permablitz. So it's an oh, organization oh, I love oh, and they do yeah. really good work and what they do is it's basically it's like a farm raising kind of approach, mm -hmm. right? Where they say, okay, we get together and we're going to work on your yard mm -hmm. and then we're going to work on my yard mm -hmm. and then we're going to work on his yard, right? And we all work together and everybody's yards are now, you know, growing food. And so it's kind of a similar idea where we look for neighborhood farmers and um, we try to develop relationships with them and if they need like manual labor we are there we are come that's with our fantastic. gloves and our hats and our boots and yeah. <laughs> do what we can that's great yeah. um, and I guess that answers my next question what is Sierra Club doing locally to advocate for better no this is a little different how how are you advocating for better stewardship of our lands and natural resources you mentioned the deal in our land these yeah. efforts. So we do a lot of engagement with the Department of Land Natural Resources. Um, they meet twice a month and uh, their meetings are public and we encourage people to attend. Um, we help people to write testimony and engage on issues that um, affect uh, you know, public trust resources, natural and cultural resources. And it's a, it's a huge um, universe of things from invasive species controls to you know, ag leases and, and or leases on public land um, to you know, water decisions. Uh, and so yeah, there's a huge variety of things that we work on um, uh, with the Department of Land Natural Resources. And, sure. you know, it's, it's, it's important work, but it's also, you know, confrontational and <laughs> controversial. Uh, but I think so far we've seen really good movement. I'm actually very happy with the appointment of Suzanne Case to DLNR. She's been very fair and thorough. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Both the Department of Land Natural Resources Board as well as the Water Commission. Um, uh -huh. But both entities have been making some solid decisions lately. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Let's switch for a moment to energy. We talk about energy in the context of global warming and climate mm. change. And uh, Hawaii has made a commitment to being a world leader in renewable energy. Where does the Sierra Club stand on Hawaii's energy future? Uh, well, we're, we're trying our darndest to get Hawaii to, to really achieve this 100% renewable goal by 2045 or sooner. And I think the thing that we are coming to the, recognize is that um, HECO is the obstacle. Hawaiian Electric Industries is... Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm responsible for my own comments. It's okay. We've had a conversation. Great. They know how we feel. <laughs> um, they just, you know, the way in which Hawaiian Electric is set up, um, uh, the way in which we have run our monopoly, an investor-owned utility, it's just not geared towards our design to support diversified renewable energy sources. And so we need to break up with ECO. It's a bad marriage, and it's not serving our interests. So uh, we will, uh, <laughs> we're, I, you know, we'll be looking at policies this coming session to figure out ways in which we can either, one, improve HECO's behavior so that their interests line up more with the public's, um, or, you know, open up, uh, create an open relationship with HECO and we can see other people. <laughs> That's quite an analogy you have there. <laughs> Great, I just came up with it just now. I hope it doesn't backfire. <laughs> and of course, that this issue is very much in the air as the uh, the recent sale, essentially, of Hico, of HEI to a, a offshore company, just was rejected. Yes, and so the that future of energy of yeah. energy is suddenly back on the table for right. discussion. So it's a very exciting time. Yes, it was a huge victory. I think we I are agree. still coming to terms with how big that victory yeah. was. We really, um, we dodged a bullet on that one because if, if Nextera had taken over our utility, it would have been 100 times harder to get where we want to go. Um, but So we have a chance now with that, um, with the way, you know, HECO is, has already indicated that they're not interested in being uh, our utility necessarily anymore. Um, so let's, let's, let's seriously investigate what our options are. And um, maybe we can come to an agreement that benefits everyone, you know, Hawaiian Electric's investors and the public. And if not, we have to put the public's interest first. And I wish more people said that. That's so nice to hear. <laughs> Thank you. So tell me a little bit more. You mentioned the uh, get. Out, uh, we, we have a get outdoors program. You have yes. programs where people go on hikes with the Sierra Club. And mm -hmm. The Hawaii Service Trip Program is that what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That right? Yeah. Tell me just a little bit about that, and also how can people get involved with the Sierra Club if they want? Can you tell us where they can connect with you on the internet? Well, you can. Our website is www.sierraclubhawaii.org, and there you can wait, wait, find. Say that again. Sierraclubhawaii.org. Sierra All spelled out. Yeah. Dot org. Thank yeah. you. And uh, there you can find all of our. Um, outings, as we call them, oh, okay. um, everything from uh, these work days to um, hikes to service trip projects where we do trail restoration. Oh, um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a great program. It's all volunteer run, and we'll train people who are interested in um, hosting their own outings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll give you all you need to know about, you know, outdoor safety, um, CPR, whatever, all of the training you need to be a, a safe and effective um, hike leader. and uh, and then encourage more people to, to participate. And um, just, just for my selfish interest, is yes. this only on Oahu? Or no, you them in the yeah, yeah. All every county oh, has wonderful. has a, a outings trips. program. Yeah, oh, and vo it's all volunteer run. And so, and on our website, you can go to each island and see what our outings programs are. And so, mm -hmm. it's a lot of Saturday Sunday hikes, um, you know, sunset hikes, those kinds of things. Like a lot of things nice. that you know help to you know uh, encourage the connection between people and the environment, and do I it imagine. in a way that doesn't have a negative impact on the environment. I think that's part of the problem. You know, people are kind of like, oh, I have my smartphone and I have Facebook and Yelp and I know the hikes to go on and I just go. Um, but oftentimes you don't recognize the uh, extent of the impact that you have on the environment, right? If a, a hundred people are all going to the, you know, high, the highest rate hike, um, we're having a significant impact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's important for us to, you know, really practice the values of care, take out what you carry in um, and, you know, not to, you know, try to clean your shoes so you don't carry invasive species, those kinds of things. So um, I, th I really encourage people to go on a hike. If you're going to go, especially if you're going to go for the first time on a hike, go with a hike leader. They'll teach you everything you need to know and you'll, you'll have such a a better experience because you'll learn about the native species, you'll learn about the history of the area, and uh, and it would really improve your appreciation of, of, of the hike they've gone on. 
So. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I'm here with Marty Townsend, director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii. I want to thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. We're here at the Ruderman Roundtable. I'm Senator Russell Ruderman from Pune District on the Big Island. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. Mahalo.